Hello, my name is Sam Jarman. I'm here to deliver a talk about measuring transfer of learning. So the hope here is that we're able to provide some insight in identifying the challenges of measuring transfer, the possible solutions, and considering future directions. So we're going to take you through some baseline information and provide you some insight into how, as we already said, transfer has often been measured, how the measurement of transfer seems to be changing in the research community, and what we might be looking for going forwards. As is important in any topic we're going to discuss, it's intelligent to define our terms. So what we want to do prior to talking about measuring transfer is define transfer. So transfer can generally be defined as learning a skill or knowledge in one area and then, or one setting, and then being asked to apply it in another area, or dis different or dissimilar situation. So you learn, you may learn a skill in a classroom setting and be asked to apply it in a clinical setting. So the things that are, are different could be the room, the things that are same, the same would be the skill, but there's some form of difference in where you've learned it versus where you've applied the skill. Now that we have a general understanding of the concept of transfer, what we want to do is take a look at two terms that occur very regularly when you're looking at transfer literature. Those two terms are near transfer and far transfer. So near transfer is considered knowledge or skills transfer between very similar contexts. So if we consider the example I gave previously of learning in a classroom and applying the new knowledge or skill in a clinical setting, that could be considered that wouldn't necessarily be considered near transfer, that would be more so considered far transfer. Near transfer could be learning in one clinic room, learning a knowledge or skill in one clinic room and applying in a different clinic room with minor, minor differences in the room setup. Far transfer is knowledge or skills transfer between superficially different contexts. So that could be considered what I've already said, learning in a classroom setting and then applying in a clinical setting or even vice versa. You learn in a clinical setting and then you're asked to apply that uh, maybe in an OSCE setting or maybe in a, in, in a classroom setting. So you kind of reverse, reverse those roles. But what we're looking at with near and far transfer is the idea that the superficial context, if those remain the same, that would be considered, or very close rather, that would be considered near transfer. And if the superficial context look different enough, then we would likely call that far transfer, which suggests that there's something else that is occurring with far transfer, and that thing is often that we're looking at the deeper structures. So when we're considering near and far transfer and what is identifiable, it seems based on the evidence available, near transfer is easier to find in research and experimental settings, uh, especially when there are concrete surface similarities. So the knowledge or skill that you're learning and being asked to take somewhere else, that at least something superficially is extremely similar. And that's when we seem to be able to appropriately identify transfer more often. Now, one of the possible reasons that it, we may be more likely to identify near transfer as opposed to far transfer more readily in experimental settings could be the way that transfer is classically, or the, the approach that is classically taken to uh, identifying transfer. So essentially what you have in an experimental setting is the initial knowledge acquisition followed by a transfer test, which, require, which is really an assessment that requires unassisted direct replication of the acquired skill or knowledge. So you've learned it in a setting and then we ask you to transfer it to some degree of difference. So uh, something such as learning to suture on a, an orange and then maybe trying to do that on either a cadaver or a silicon trainer. And we're looking for, or classically, we're looking for you to be able to do that without any cueing, without any help. And then what we find is the further away we go superficially, from learning to transfer test, we, without aid, without direction, or without cueing, we seem to identify transfer less.
So a term that is highly associated with the essentially direct application paradigm of assessing transfer is sequestered problem solving. So the idea is that you're, again, as we've already said, you're looking for unaided direct application or direct replication of a knowledge or skill learned in one context and moved into some degree of difference from that initial context. And that sequestration is essentially trying to not contaminate the environment. We're trying to see if it will happen on its own based on the initial educational intervention. And again, the thing that we seem to be identifying is that when we use this paradigm, transfer, near transfer is identifiable. The further away you go in superficial contextual differences, you have a harder time identifying transfer. For the purpose of reiteration, we just want to synthesize and say that the idea of sequestered problem solving and direct application, these terms are often found very close to one another or directly related to one another within the realm of transfer literature. And what is essentially argued is that that sequestered problem solving model uh, is directly accompanied by a theory that is characterized by the belief that a learner is able to directly apply previous learning to a novel setting or problem. So there's an underlying assumption that if you've learned it in one place, you should be able to apply it in a different one. And as we continue to reiterate, the information and the available evidence suggests that this is possible or at least observable with very, very superficially similar situations. And when we get further, superficially further away, again, we have with this paradigm, with this direct application, sequester problem solving paradigm, we do have a hard time identifying what would be often termed for a transfer. So since we keep harping on the concept that it is difficult or it seems difficult to identify for a transfer with a direct application sequester problem solving paradigm, what we want to do is maybe take a moment and consider the situations or the conditions in which we do identify FAR transfer. And those seem to be recognition of structural similarities, which allows learners to activate prior knowledge. So there has to be something that the learner can cue into and identify that will activate that knowledge that they learned in the other context, which you're hoping will show up and be applied in the new context. The explicit identification of a structural similarity by, between problems by an external source, which would often be a teacher. So the teacher is telling you when you are learning the new skill, the new knowledge, the new approach, that you should be looking for these cues at all times when, it, when this knowledge should be applied. So we explicitly teach you that when you see this cue or whatever cue it may be, it is time to activate the knowledge that you're being taught at this point, such that when we put you into that more novel context and one of those cues is available and you've been told that when you see that cue, you should activate the knowledge, you're more likely to do it. So it seems that explicit identification of those cues by an instructor or the ability to recognize those cues when not instructed by the, by the learner those cues seem to be the things that allow for far transfer when it is observed. So now that we've already considered the situations that seem to aid far transfer, we can look on the other side of the equation to consider things that get in the way of far transfer. So the ability to notice the similarities between cases. So if you do not appropriately identify the similarities or the cues that would activate the novel or the new knowledge or new skill that you've learned to be applied in the novel situation, then you won't be able to produce the new knowledge or new skill. So it could be suggested that you may have appropriately learned the novel skill, the new knowledge, the new approach to problem solving, whatever it may be, when we put you in the novel context, you don't appropriately identify the cues. So you just can't see the cues. Therefore, it looks like you, 
It doesn't necessarily look like you haven't learned the skill, it looks like you're unable to transfer it because you didn't notice those cues. So the ability to ignore expectations of a previously learned concept in the presence of overt perceptual information. So there's something that should cue you into activating the new knowledge, the new approach, the new skill. However, you're unable to see it again. So there's something else that would block you. The ability to ignore surface similarities also seems to be a problem. So there may be things that are very, very similar superficially, but there is something, a deeper feature or a deeper cue that should activate that new knowledge. However, you just don't see it because you can't ignore what you see very superficially as the learner. This leads into the argument that far transfer really is more so the ability to let go of old behaviors to allow for the new ones to occur. So often we will be in situations where because of previous experience, we have a response that may be well learned, may be well primed, uh, or may seem very high utility. However, because there's something else really going on and we're not able to get past that old behavior, we're not able to activate the new one. So again, that leads to the argument that it's at least possible for our transfer is much more predicated on the ability to forget old behaviors to allow for those new ones to occur. So as we had mentioned previously, one of the things that seems to prime for far transfer is the explicit identification of cues uh, and the explicit identification of the deeper features of the knowledge or the skill or the procedure being learned by a teacher, by an external source, that seems to prime for far transfer. So if we would like to display far transfer more often or identify it more often, maybe we should change our teaching style in order to prime for that case. However, there is an argument that can be made that if the teacher is explicitly telling you to look for something or to do something or to identify a cue, which would prime far transfer, there is an argument to suggest that really it isn't far transfer, it's more so following rules or following instructions appropriately. Because if we look at the direct application sequester problem solving model, there is the underlying assumption that transfer should be more or less spontaneous. Now, when we identify far transfer, it seems that it doesn't happen spontaneously. There has to be something that allows for the learner to identify the cues that would activate the knowledge. And often those cues are not necessarily directly visible. Sometimes they're deeper inside of a problem and we would often call them the deep features of a skill, the deep features of a procedure or the deep features of knowledge, right? So again, we just want to present that the counter argument to priming and purposely explicitly teaching those deeper features is that in the direct applications to question problem solving model, the hope and the underlying assumption is that transfer happens spontaneously. So in light of the disagreement between explicitly priming for far transfer by teaching the deeper features and the deeper structures versus the concept that explicitly teaching those deep features and deep structures really just teaches people to follow instructions and it doesn't necessarily count as far transfer because the direct application sequester problem solving paradigm has the underlying assumption that transfer is spontaneous when we do identify far transfer in these situations, it seems to be more so in experts because experts are argued to have more ability identifying similar structures or identifying abstractions really because they have more experience with it, more practice with it when compared to novices. So in the direct application sequester problem solving paradigm, when we do happen to see the spontaneous transfer, it, ha it seems to be more identifiable in experts So in considering the classical approach to identifying transfer of learning, and that seems to be the direct application sequester problem solving paradigm, we are able to identify in that paradigm that we're, we can observably see near transfer more often, far transfer less often, far transfer seems to be primed by identifying the explicit 
or explicitly teaching and priming for the deep features and the deep structures to allow for abstraction by a novice learner. And when we don't, when we don't prime for far transfer, if we do see it in this spontaneous kind of spontaneous transfer type of way, it seems to be more in experts. So we can identify that this mode of looking for transfer shows certain observable features, it shows certain patterns. So it may be worth considering other perspectives with respect to transfer. So considering the observable features and observable patterns within the direct applications to question problem solving paradigm, that we don't seem to be getting what we hope for from transfer learning. So if we consider the longer term historical desire to teach skills and hope those things to transfer, maybe we think about computer programming to improve general problem solving skills or learning Latin to be better at science or something of that nature, and we don't see it working the way that we desire, especially when we are using that direct application spontaneous problem solving model, we may want to reconsider what our goals are with, with transfer and with working on identifying transfer. So if we reconsider our goals and shift our perspective, we may have the opportunity to either find more transfer, find it in a different place, or find out that it just doesn't work the way that we really want it to. So one of the approaches to shifting perspective with respect to transfer is really getting in and becoming very granular with the operational, operational definitions of transfer. So really, really clearly defining what it is you're looking for. If you're looking for a change in speed, a change in accuracy, a change in problem solving approach, a change in you know, using knowledge in, from one place to another, really get in and get granular with your definition of transfer and it will allow you to more appropriately design an experiment and then measure transfer or measure the transfer that you're actually looking for. So one way to improve the clarity um, and when looking for transfer or when trying to operationalize your definition of transfer is identifying the conditions under which transfer generally has been shown to occur. So we have thorough and diverse practice, explicit abstraction, active self-monitoring, arousing mindfulness, using metaphors or analogies, abstraction, transfer by affordances, and high and low road. So these are the conditions which can be further defined for, again, that granularity, but if we identify the conditions that we have observed transfer to occur, we can then wield that to our benefit and to the benefit of learners by maybe designing our curriculum or our research or our experiments slightly differently to be able to utilize those to better identify transfer. Now, if our aim is specifically to look at being very granular and improving the clarity of the definition or operational definition of transfer, then we can look to Barnett and Cece uh, from 2002, and they provide the suggestion that we should be very, very clear on the nature of the skill that we're looking to transfer, the performance change, so speed, accuracy, uh, problem solving approach, something like that, and the memory demands for the, for the transfer task used to measure it. So now what they're doing is they're actually looking at the test itself. The testing situation could be the problem. So you may not necessarily see the transfer because the task that you're asking or the assessment task, the transfer task, may be too demanding on memory. So the person in that newer skill or that more novice phase of skill acquisition may be less likely to perform well because the test is too complicated. We also want to be clear on the distance between training and transfer contests along the following dimensions, which is the knowledge domain, the physical content, or physical context, the temporal context, so timing, the functional context, the social context, and the modality. So how far are we asking people to go from their original, original context along those 
suggested axes or those suggested modalities or those suggested contexts, how far are we asking them to transfer? Because the further we're asking them to transfer, we should have expectations as a result of that. So we want to really consider defining the skill that we're looking to be transferred, the nature of it, the performance change, again, accuracy, speed, uh, problem solving approach, and the memory demands. So those are very, very important because we need to be clear on those and then we can consider the context subsequently to better operationalize our definition of transfer so that we can design a better experiment and a better research approach. So if we understand that improving the operational definition of transfer allows us to better create a research setting or an experimental setting to appropriately measure and identify transfer, and then we consider that the direct application sequester problem solving approach seems to identify FAR transfer better in experts, we may want to consider shifting our perspective. So we've improved the operational definition or our ability to create an operational definition we may want to shift our perspective. Now, if we do that, we can identify the preparation for future learning approach, which really is aiming to look for improvement in the speed or quality of learning in a novel environment, or really a no not only novel, but a knowledge-rich environment. So where the DA, or the Direct Application Suppressor Problem Solving Approach and Paradigm seems to identify far transfer better in experts, the PFL approach isn't really looking for direct replication of a knowledge, procedure, or skill. What it's looking for is evidence of improvement in speed or quality of learning in a novel situation based on an initial intervention when compared between groups. So if you have a group that had a specific type of educational intervention versus a group that didn't, the group that had the intervention ideally should show improvement in skill or improvement in speed or quality of learning not necessarily accuracy, but again, speed or quality of learning in a knowledge-rich environment. So the PFL paradigm seems to be more looking again at improvement in learning in a new environment as opposed to in the direct replication of the knowledge or skill. So it seems that the PFL paradigm may be more appropriate for a novice or somebody who may not necessarily be a novice in the field, but is engaging in a novel procedure, a novel knowledge, or a novel skill. So the idea of identifying learning earlier in the educational process may be what PFL is better at doing compared to the direct application suppression problem solving approach. So considering that PFL or preparation for future learning is looking for something different, we have to consider or it's looking for something different than the direct application suppressor problem solving paradigm in that we're looking for improvement in speed or quality of learning as opposed to direct, like, direct replication of knowledge or skills. So we may need to change the way that we're looking for the quality that we're attempting to identify. Now, it's a very common way to do this with respect to PFL or preparation for future learning is a double transfer design. So you have two initial learning treatments so you can call it learning treatment A and learning treatment B. You have the standard transfer problem, right? So they have different initial learning environments. You have a standard transfer problem. Then you have a common learning resource, right? Which they're attempting to transfer in their knowledge to. And then what you do is after the common learning resource, so they've had, again, initial learning, which is different, transfer problem, which is the same, new learning, common learning resource, which is the same, and then we have the target transfer problem. So that's why they call it the double transfer design because there's two transfer tests. And what we're looking for is to differentiate if the initial intervention made a difference in speed or quality of learning. So it can be said that the standard way that PFL has been looked for can be quite complicated in research design, especially when compared to a more straightforward single transfer problem that you'd find in the direct application or sequester problem solving paradigm. So if we accept that creating a double transfer design 
to identify preparation for future learning is more complicated than the direct application sequester problem solving paradigm, which has a single transfer test, we can consider that we should hopefully be able to find other ways to identify preparation for future learning. So one of the suggestions that's been made and carried out is trying to identify the skill and the will of learners to ident or learners to show signs of preparation for future learning by assessing how they interface with a common learning resource. So one experiment that's been done was non-medical graduate and undergraduate students learning medical diagnostic information from a common resource. So they all had the same resource and the graduate students were compared to the undergraduate students in how they interface with that resource. The undergraduate students just flipped straight through and tried to memorize everything, where the graduate students created their own symptom disease matrices, they codified the knowledge, they organized it, and then they ended up performing better on the transfer test because they were, they had the skill or the increased skill of organizing knowledge that had occurred likely through their transition from undergraduate to graduate education, whereas the undergraduate students had the will to learn, but they didn't have the extra skill of codifying, organizing the knowledge. So what we can say from that is that if we provide an educational intervention that would allow people to better organize new knowledge, they may perform better in a transfer setting or in a setting where we're again attempting to identify improvements in speed or quality of learning. So again, in moving back to the concept of being very clear with our operational definition, with respect to preparation for future learning, we want to be very clear that what we're looking for, because we want to identify, first of all, the, trans the skill that we're looking to be transferred or the knowledge that we're looking to be transferred, and we want to make sure that we clearly understand the performance change. The performance change being searched for, searched for or sought out with respect to the paradigm of preparation for future learning is not is not application, it's not direct application, it's not perfect replication of knowledge or skill. It is evidence of improved speed or quality of learning in the transfer environment, right? So the transfer environment is going to usually be novel, right? It's going to be often very novel, such that what we're looking for, again, is the educational intervention to improve speed or quality of learning as opposed to direct replication of a skill or of knowledge. Now, considering that we've already been able to speak about and identify the situations under which transfer, near, both near and far transfer, show up in the direct application and sequestered problem solving model, or the, the paradigm, what we want to consider is when has identifiable improvements in speed or quality of learning in a knowledge-rich environment, which we'll call identifying PFL, when has that occurred? And what we seem to be able to identify is that when there is a mix of guided and discovery learning, so a mix of essentially of instructor-led and student-led learning, we seem to be able to identify improvements in speed and quality of learning in knowledge-rich environments when that has occurred. Now, one way to approach this is what's called productive failure. Now, productive failure could be said to be a technique or a methodology that leads to preparation for future learning. So this is one way to wield the mix of discovery and guided learning. Essentially in productive failure, what you do is you have the student engage in a discovery process where they're provided a problem that they're very unlikely to solve, that they are going to fail at. So the failure can be termed productive because when you are attempting to solve a novel problem that you are unable to solve, followed by an expert or followed by an instructor showing you how to solve the problem, what you're able to do is compare and contrast your approach versus the expert's approach. Therefore, you seem to be better able to use that insight, use that knowledge when put in another novel situation. So when people only learn how to solve the problem directly from the teacher versus failing first, the people that only learn from the teacher put in the novel situation seem to run into the problems of that get in the way of far transfer. They're not able to forget the learned behavior 
to go into the novel solution or the novel method that is required to solve the problem. Now in PFL measurements, we're not always seeing perfect answers or perfect application of knowledge or getting the right answer. Again, we're looking to compare and contrast improvements in speed and quality of learning. Therefore, productive failure doesn't necessarily mean somebody's going to be put in a novel situation and accurately solve the problem. However, when they have failed first, followed by learning the correct approach, the correct solution, the correct skill, they seem to perform better in the next novel situation, where again, when simply taught directly how to perform a skill and put in a novel situation, those learners have run again into that problem where with respect to far transfer, they're having a harder time forgetting the initially learned behavior or forgetting old behaviors. So it may be suggested that at least if we are looking for improvement in ability to perform or to learn in a novel situation, just teaching somebody a skill may not be as ideal as we would hope. We may want to, at least based on current evidence, we may want to have them fail first and then be taught how to do it after. That may be the most appropriate approach, but we can also consider other approaches, but we'd have to go out and perform those experiments to see if there's another way to do this. But so far, productive failure seems to be a fairly good technique to drive preparation for future learning. So for the point of reiterating, the two perspectives that we've discussed with, attempt, with respect to identifying, or at least attempting to identify transfer, we have the classical approach, which is direct application, uh, as measured by sequestered problem solving, looking for spontaneous replication or spontaneous application of newly learned knowledge in a novel setting. And this seems to identify near transfer more regularly, and when it does identify far transfer, it seems to be either when, ex when students are explicitly told to look for certain cues, which can be argued to be following instructions in this model, and when far transfer is identified in a spontaneous fashion, it seems to be more often in experts, whereas preparation for future learning is not looking for direct application. What it's looking for is improvements in speed or quality of learning, and this seems to be more appropriate when we're looking for the improvement in speed or quality of learning because that's grant in a, an operational sense what we're claiming we're looking for and this seems to work better in a no, in a novice situation or a novel situation because what we're looking at is when we put somebody in a novel situation we're not aiming to identify whether they can accurately solve the problem we're looking to see if they can get closer compared to another group there are multiple ways of measuring that but we are very we must be very clear on what we're measuring, therefore we can then create appropriate measurements. Now PFL is fairly young compared to the direct application sequester problem solving paradigm, but we have growing evidence and we are watching development of novel approaches because we're trying to figure out how to measure something new. Right? Now both perspectives will likely benefit from very clear operationalized definitions, which is why we have harped on it so much in this presentation. We want to be really clear on the skill that we're trying to transfer, the change or the skill or knowledge or approach that we're trying to transfer, the change in it. Are we looking for a change in speed, a change in accuracy, or a change in approach? And once we have clearly identified those, we're then again able to better create our experimental settings or our research settings to identify those.